Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. Today I want to talk to you about the nature of the personality type. Yeah, often what I've found is that we are all different. We all think differently. We all have a different consciousness. And I want you to imagine yourself standing in front of a classroom with 16 people all sitting spread across you with benches. All of them of different backgrounds, of different age groups, of different development and of different personality types. I want you to look at and see the introverts in this classroom. I want you to see the extroverts of this classroom. I want you to look at the imaginative dreamers. I want you to look at the rational types. I want you to look at the people that are the most goal oriented and that have the strongest idea of what they want. And I want you to look at the most adaptable and flexible people in the room. And I want you to recognize for a second that all of these people have their unique strengths, their unique abilities, their unique needs. Yeah, if you are a teacher or a boss, the success of your company is about how you can motivate all these people, how you can use their skills and abilities and how you can speak to them. The more you force them to be something they are not, the more you inhibit their motivation, their passion and their energy, and the more they're gonna struggle to perform well at your workplace. So what I'm finding out as I dive into this topic of personality is that I've been living my entire life wrong. I have been forcing myself to be something I was not. I've been forcing myself to fit with expectations that were not for me. And because of that, I came to suffer from unnecessary stress and anxiety throughout a lot of my later teenage years. I started on a quest of personal discovery, on searching for myself, on searching for who I was and for what my unique passion was. I came to find that I had started to neglect my primary interests, my core need for philosophy, for theoretical discussions for searching for myself, for my purpose and my unique identity. I had neglected some of the core of myself. And I had neglected it because we have this society that believes people should be molded and trained to think and act similarly. This discussion, this presentation is going to talk about the difference between nature and nurture and I think this difference is so important. I believe that people have come to develop often in ways that are contrary directly to their nature. I believe that the people you're looking at that you think are intuitives might not always be intuitives. The people that you're looking at that you thought were sensors or introverts might not necessarily be introverts. What this means is that we are seeing them based on how they have developed to be rather than what is unique to them, rather than what is true to them. And that's why a lot of the MBTI practitioners fail. Their standard methods, their methods of typing and testing people often lead to inaccurate conclusions about people. When these companies come to your workplace to teach you the ways of the MBTI, often because they mistype, the methods and solutions they offer don't help as much as they could. I'm not saying they don't help, but I'm saying they could help more. When I was reading through neuroscience and psychology, what I came to realize was there are processes in the human mind, networks in the human mind directly aligned to your cognitive functions, to your personality type and to how you were wired. There is genetic markers in you that directly relate to your personality type. Things such as dopamine D2 receptors in the human mind and genetics such as the COMT158 all <laughs> work together to create you. And yeah, that's complicated. It's very complicated. But it shows the picture that there are hardwired traits, needs and interests in you. There are things in you that you have in inherited from your parents, and from your grandparents, and from the parents before them. There are traumas here, soft-wired traumas, and then there are more hardwired things such as what your interests will be, or what you will find yourself more drawn towards, what your passion is, what you find more inherently important than other things. 
What I've learned is that the difference between nature and nurture is quite simple. Nature is your hardwired personality, what you find yourself drawn to, what you love, what you want to do, what you find important, what you find necessary, what you find meaningful. Nature is also your temperament, how you like to think, your natural orientation, how you like to take in and manage information. Your nurture is what you have developed to do, what you have taught yourself you should do, what you tell yourself is important even though you don't like it. Your nurture is your persona, the mask you put on, the personality you put on when you go sit down with your friends that don't let you be yourself, when you go to your workplace that talks about the value of being proactive, when you go to your school and they talk about the need to sit still in the classroom. Development, nurture is constantly colliding with your nature. You're constantly managing whether you should be true to yourself or whether you should adjust to your group or to your environment. At times, sometimes, it can even be better to go with your nurture. But what I try to tell people is, if you do this too often, it will come at the expense of something inside of you. You'll find yourself feeling like you want to do something, but you don't have the energy to do it. You'll find yourself feeling frustrated and anxious. You'll find yourself feeling somewhat stressed out and tense. Yeah, being like this, it can feel like kind of walking around with a constant headache. To do this requires you to constantly talk yourself into doing it. You have to constantly tell yourself you want to do it. I want to do it. No, that's not how it works. Yeah, basically, we're trying to sell and indoctrinate ourselves to do things we don't like. And we use, we use all kinds of motivators to do this. We tell ourselves, if I do this, I can have uh, candy. If I do this, I can have a cup of coffee. If I do this, I can have sugar. If I do this, I can go home later in the evening or the weekend and have a, great, have a beer. And uh, of course, to many, that is a necessity of life. Working is a necessity of life. Very few people can step out of that rat race. This is how the world has been set up. But there are things you could do at your workplace. There are things you could do at your school to make your life a little better. And there are things you could do that would require, that would make it easier for you to relax some of that guard. And there is a chance that if you're able to do this, you will only become more passionate, more energetic, more calm, more stable, and less stressed. Let's get right into it. Let's get right into that question of your basic temperament, how you prefer to think. So what I've realized when it comes to your temperament is that temperament is how you manage your emotional and rational self. How you manage your thoughts and your experiences and your decisions. How you manage information. How you like to take in and process information. I found that extroverts came to rely more on the bottom-up network involved with processing new information and they making decisions based on options that lay before you. I came to realize that introverts favor the top-down process of looking at what you know about the situation, your personal map or compass for how the world should be or how things should be, and using this information to make decisions. Introverts and extroverts are wired differently here. And what I'm realizing as I study the world of personality types and of temperament is temperament is like a big blind spot. It's like only seeing one side of the coin, or only seeing this world from this one problematic perspective. Introverts tend to place most responsibility on themselves. They see themselves responsible for what they think and for what they do. They see themselves responsible for their own perspective. When something is wrong, there is something wrong in the side. Something you have to change inside in how you think and how you process information. Introverts have this 
worldview where everything's about them and how they see the world and their responsibility. They are responsible for everyone else and for everything happening in the world. It's all because of what they thought or what they believed or what they saw or what they know to be true. Extroverts tend to rather place the importance on the world. How they feel is a direct result of how their environment is shaped and structured, the emotions they absorb from other people, the things they see and take in in a cluttered and messy environment, the things they pick up on and hear from other people. The extrovert is always processing what they've heard different people say. The extrovert is always thinking about what they feel about what they've heard. The extrovert is always processing what they think about what they've seen, or if it's true or not. Yeah, extroverts are in the state of processing and taking in and managing information that is coming from the outside in. The introvert is all about managing information that's happening inside and using it and putting this out in the world. We tend to say that introverts are only on the inside and extroverts are only on the outside. But truly there is a process here. An extrovert prefers to take in information from the outside in and then out. From the outside in and then out. And that's a completely different process than the introvert. The introvert prefers to start inside and then go out. And then find things outside that match with what you think. An introvert is like Google. You know what you want, you know what you're looking for, and you're only seeing what you're looking for. The extrovert is like scrolling through a blog or a website, seeing things around you and then making associations to past memories and things you've heard and seen in the past. And that's the base difference of the introvert and the extrovert. Outgoingness has nothing to do with this. But sharing information does. Yeah, extroverts are more comfortable sharing information, sharing information, thoughts, perspectives and emotions with other people. They place the importance on their environment and the different people and they see other people as responsible too for how they feel. Yeah, extroverts are talking with other people about their experiences and telling other people don't do this, don't be like that, don't say that, don't talk like that. Extroverts are managing people, extroverts are involved with their environment in a different way than the introvert. Extroverts are more about sharing and managing and organizing their environment. Uh, putting things together in a bookshelf, putting things around them in order, creating a harmonious environment, creating a place where you can breathe and relax and be happy. Introverts are all about that inner space, creating inner harmony and in how you think and how you feel and your perspective on the world. Another core part of temperament is whether you are a judging or a perceiving type. You'll find that as a judging type, you're more inclined towards long-term emotional and logical goals, long-term information processing. A judging type is all about that process of working towards resolving an emotional state or what you feel through long-term, consistent, organized action. When a judging type feels an emotion, their initial action is, will this emotion stay or will it come to pass? The judging type waits, the judging type sees, does it remain, am I still going to be upset tomorrow? And if they are, that's when they start really getting into this emotion. Why, why am I upset? Why am I constantly feeling this way? Judging types are more proactive, uh, preoccupied with their long-term emotions, to how they feel in a longer perspective. Am I going to be happy like this? Am I going to feel like this forever? Judging types are more about devising goals and strategies for resolving their emotions. When a judging type feels angry, they think about a strategy to deal with and to manage this emotion. When a judging type feels something and they become aware of it, they start organizing and finding solutions and long-term practical aspects. They start disciplining themselves. They start creating a system of routine to resolve this standard or to resolve this emotional state and to resolve their thoughts. The judging type starts honing in their mind and disciplining their thoughts to ensure that they can work proactively long-term towards resolving and finding peace and finding positive emotional balance. 
the judging type feels relaxed when they, they are able to find a strategy that they think will work to deal with and to manage this emotion, to manage how they feel, to manage how they think. The judging type feels more rewarded when they can find a long-term solution to an emotion rather than when they have to keep on responding to the emotion every time it comes up yeah, in the moment. You'll find if you're a perceiving type that your process is vastly different from this. Often judging and perceiving has to do with need for closure, how long-term or short-term your need for closure is. Perceiving types I found responded differently to dopamine. They took the perceiving type would more quickly build up dopamine and feel more stressed about things that happened around them or what happened inside. When the perceiving type would start feeling something or would notice something, they would feel more immediately that they had to bring it up and talk about it. When the perceiving type felt something, they would feel that they had to act and do something about it in the moment. They would have to bring it up, they had to, would have to talk about it, they would have to deal with it. The perceiving type would prefer short-term action and would be more open to distractions. If something came up, a reward or an opportunity came up, or a new option popped up in your head, the perceiving type would be more inclined to choose freedom, freedom to explore these options and opportunities, freedom to change your goal or to change your mind and to jump at this new possibility. The perceiving type has a temperament of an explorer or an advisor. An explorer that will see new opportunities and that will jump at new platforms and that will chase new things, that will look and study their environment and what's happening around them, that would respond instinctively to things that were occurring around them, that would take and deal with the immediate world. The judging type had the temperament of a leader and executive. The leader or the executive who plans and strategizes and organizes and manages long term. Who avoids or immediate temptations or distractions. That ignores new opportunities and options and things that they deem unlikely to happen. Often I would find that the perceiving types could act like and develop themselves to think like judges. But only at the expense of more stress. When a perceiving type went into this judging mindset, when they took on preferences of an executive or a leader, they would find themselves having to constantly force themselves to do so through using various means and standards and routines. When a perceiving type went into judging, they would find themselves constantly having to tense up. They would constantly have to be on the foot and tell themselves, I have to be like this. And they would constantly feel this need to go on something. They would see a new opportunity and they would really want to go on it. But they would keep on having to discipline themselves. No, I should not go for it. I should not take this opportunity. I should be logical, rational and stay on the goal. Yeah, often the key distinction between the judging and the perceiving type was rather that the judging type did not see as much value in these things. The judging type would not say that this new opportunity was valuable. The judging type would not see this new option. They would not think of this new opportunity. And therefore they would not feel stressed by it. No, often when a judging type is offered a new opportunity, they would rather appear stressed or tense. It's like this even suggestion of this option or this change coming to happen would stress this judging type out. Yeah, the executive or the leader does not like when things change. The leader says, oh, I don't think this opportunity will happen. That's not going to happen. That's not likely. I don't think so. The judging type would say, would feel distracted by these new opportunities, even if they were positive ones. Even a positive offer, such as going out immediately for a cup of coffee, would feel like a distraction. Like, a, no, I don't want to go out for a cup of coffee. I want to finish this work. And that's often... What made you a judging type? That preference for long-term closure over short-term closure. Yeah, the heart of it all is stress. That experience of tension. That fear experience of needing to do something or having to do something. But also that experience of feeling blocked. Feeling like you want to do something but you can't do it. Feeling like there's something you feel urged to do that you can't do. 
For the judging type, it is feeling blocked from exploring a long-term opportunity because you're constantly distracted by other things. For the perceiving type, it is constantly feeling blocked from exploring new opportunities because you're always forced to act and do things in a certain way. When you are experiencing and getting too far into these blocks, you're also getting more stressed. If you are a boss and you are forcing all your workers and employees to think and act in a certain way, you're forcing everyone to act like judges or as perceivers, then you're noticing that all your employees are also more stressed and you're thinking why are they so stressed, why are they so tense, why are they not following along in this procedure. Yeah, often what you're gonna have to learn is to relax some of that control. To not enforce too strict standards and to allow freedom for uh, perceived types to explore new opportunities and structure and order for judging types to work long term on a project. Yeah, you're gonna want some people at your workplace to work on six month to one year long projects without distractions. And you're gonna want other people at your workplace to have new opportunities and chances to work in short term projects and to work with responding to and intercepting new opportunities for your company. And then you're doing so, you're getting a workplace, you're building a company that allows you both the chance to explore new options and also the chance to complete some fascinating, huge, long-term, big-picture projects. And now that you've realized this, and you're starting to think about how to build a better workplace or a better environment for yourself as a judging or perceiving type, let's go back to introversion and extroversion. I said that judges and perceivers would feel more stressed and more blocked if their environment was not made for them. I also say that introverts and extroverts would become more anxious and more chaotic and would feel more turbulence and more conflict in case their environment was not built for them. Yeah, often the number one issue with extroverts is that feeling of not having stability, of not having an environment that gives them the input they need. Yeah, extroverts need a lot of input from other people. Extroverts need constant feedback and communication from others. Extroverts need to hear what you think. Extroverts need to hear what your workplace is currently working on. Extroverts need you to share. And if you don't share, that's when extroverts start feeling a sense of conflict. Yeah, extroverts that are in situations that don't give them information become more prone to conflict and to turbulence and to instability. They will start thinking something is wrong, they will start misunderstanding you, they will start assuming that you are upset with them when you're not. And the problem here is not just extroverts, introverts have the reverse problem. Introverts are more likely to enter a state of conflict when they feel rushed, rushed to produce, rushed to do something quickly. Introverts don't like when they are forced to make up their minds too quickly. Introverts don't like being rushed into a certain decision or a certain opinion. When your workplace is trying to get them to make up their minds about something in just a minute, when your company or workplace is forcing people to make a decision immediately, they're also building a situation where introverts are starting to get more anxious and more unstable. Introverts can force themselves into a certain opinion or into thinking a certain way quickly. Introverts can force themselves to make a quick decision. But you'll find that these introverts are also becoming more restless, more prone to misunderstandings, more prone to rashness, and to bad decisions. When a situation or a workplace is struggling to build an environment that works for both introverts and extroverts, conflicts tend to be huge. There tend to be lots of misunderstandings, there tend to be lots of struggles, people misunderstanding each other, people reading in things that aren't there, people that feel that my needs as an introvert or an extrovert is not respected, people thinking that there is something wrong or bad intentions driving all of this. And here, what you have to do is think about what you can do to solve these issues. What can you do to ensure that extroverts get new information, new information to manage, new information to deal with? What can you do to ensure that extroverts get something to hold, something to touch, something to do, so that they can keep up a good energy, calm, rationality, and order and stability? What can you do to ensure that introverts get the time to think, to process, and to deal with, and to respond to, and think about their action before they take a decision? Can you perhaps at your meetings say, let's take one minute to think? 
can you perhaps at your environment say, okay, let's have a discussion. Can you at your workplace say, okay, everyone can walk around for a bit and uh, just hang out. Can you ensure everyone has breaks and times to share and discuss? Can you ensure people have privacy and the ability to take a step back into themselves? Often when managing introverts and extroverts, you're going to need to manage a few different strategies and you're going to need to ensure there are strategies for both types at the same time. Yeah, introversion and extroversion is the natural cause of conflict, tension and unrest. Think about it as wind. Wind coming from the west and the east. Introverts like to come from inside out. They have this process, this natural flow. But if you're forcing them to think like an extrovert, if you're forcing them to take from, think from the east in, east to the west, what you're gonna be noticing is that all this energy is colliding. It's starting to collide and it's starting to build up to some kind of friction, to some kind of possibly even a storm. And that's also why introverts and extroversion tend to be much more conflict oriented, much prone to misunderstandings, much prone to anxiety, much prone to feeling like something is wrong, that something is off, that something that they don't have stability. They, they, there's this anxiety here, there's this feeling of pain or hurt or anger or frustration as the introvert is forced into a state that is uncomfortable for them. And I'm not saying that these conflicts can sometimes be helpful or necessary. Yeah, sometimes this can bring up things that are positive. Sometimes the introvert can, in this process, learn things. Sometimes they can grow. Yeah, often there is nothing wrong with being able to do this, but it's about accommodating and working to, when possible, support this flow and to only upset it when it's necessary. Now, thinking about temperament. Temperament, like I said before, had everything to do with how you like to take in information and manage emotions. I said I was a leader. I said that I tend to place responsibility on myself. A leader is an introvert and a judging type. A leader is a person that likes to come from within out. A leader is a person that likes to organize and manage and to form strategies for responding to their emotions and to their feelings often developing a code of conduct or a way of being or a way of thinking or a strategy to ensure that you will stop feeling that way and that you will feel better or that you'll keep on feeling this way and that you'll make sure that you can keep on to this positive state. What I'm learning is there are also three other temperaments that think vastly different to me. We know also the executives, the more extroverted judging types. Their key difference to me is they work from outwards in. They place the key importance in the group and the environment and the organization and the structure. They will be more hands-on. When something is wrong, they will go to people and say, something is wrong, we need to do something about this. When an introvert, when a leader feels something is wrong, they go inside and they say, I'm, something is wrong, I have to fix this. And that's often a key distinction between these two types. When looking at and comparing the leader to the advisor, you'll find that as an advisor, you're more about immediate responses to how you feel. If you're feeling bad, you're going to start thinking, why am I feeling bad? Why am I suffering? Why am I struggling? You're going to think about what you can do in this moment to stop feeling bad. What can you say? What can you do? What can you uh, change to make your situation better? Yeah, the perceiving type is much more flexible, much more about immediate changes and fixes and adjustments in the moment to always be in line with their feelings, to trust their feelings, to trust their thinking, to ensure that they can respond to and deal with this appropriately. And finally, if you're an explorer type, what you will find is that you need to have this lifestyle where things are happening. New information is coming. There are things going on. New things to process. New things to deal with. Things you can grab and take by the horns. When you feel bad, you can express yourself freely. You can tell people, I feel bad. We should do something about it. When things are uh, going wrong, you can start working immediately to organize and to fix the situation, to make it better. The explorer likes to work in the moment to deal with, to respond to new problems and new issues. The explorer likes to jump at new opportunities. The explorer is 
one of four different temperaments and we're all thinking differently. We're all coming at this situation differently, but we all at the end of the day might be valuing the same things. Leaders and explorers and executives and advisors all are searching for stability, for peace of mind, for freedom from stress, from relaxation, from focus, from being able to have closure and from being able to have understanding and a sense of rationale, a sense of control and calm. Now temperament has to do with how we like to think, but there is something else, something that has more to do with your core values. What kind of information do you find fun? Imagine what situations make you feel the most energized. Think about the places, environments, the things you read, the things you hear that fill you with thrill and excitement and joy. Think about what gives you a kick of energy, a kick of stimulation, what makes you feel like this, wow, that's interesting. We have all different interests and passions, and interests and passions are almost hardwired. Of course, the smaller things can change. You can stop being interested in medicine, or you can start finding a sudden interest in psychology. You can change your mind and realize you're not interested in sociology, or that you're rather interested in history. Those things can change, but our core interest for intuition or for sensing, that can all remain consistent throughout your entire life. The intuitive will always value abstraction, new theories, novelty, the chance to learn or discover something new. The intuitive values topics and fields where we don't know as much yet. The intuitive is more interested in subtleties, the what's hidden, what's under the rock, what we don't know yet. Intuitives are more likely to traverse environments and fields that nobody has been to yet. Intuitives like to step into roles and characters and behavior that people have not been doing before. Yeah, you'll find that intuitives are often flocking to the new groups, the new environments, the new situations. They were the first to YouTube and to the internet. And then, only after them, did the sensors come. Yeah, the sensor has a different priority. As a sensor, you're about what's immediate, what's attention-grabbing, what's strong, what's real, what's concrete, what you can grab, hear, see, what, what you can find around you. The sensor has this temperament of a person that values strength and immediacy and attention. The sensor is the most attentive and the most interested in what you can see and hear. If I was making this video for the sensor, I might add more richness and effects and more power to grab the audience better. I would perhaps speak loudly. I would perhaps switch my tone. I would perhaps do something to shock you or to stimulate you or to get you to go, wow, what, wow. <laughs> yeah, often sensors speak in stronger language. Sensors use stronger words. Sensors are tougher, so more resilient, less sensitive. Yeah, often what I'm finding is the key distinction between a sensor and intuitive is that experience of being sensitive. Sensors are less sensitive to environmental sensations and stimuli. Sensors are less sensitive to sirens from an ambulance or for something happening around them. They're more happy, more energized when there are things happening around them. The sensor enjoys being at a party or being at a festival or being in an environment where things are happening, where things are right now going on. Sensors enjoy environments that offer this concreteness, this tangibility, this salience, this sense that what I'm doing is important and necessary. Yeah, sensors often dismiss new ideas because they look unimportant. The internet, what's that? That doesn't sound fun. Why don't you just live in the moment instead? Yeah, that's often the core response in the past. But as the internet grew in tangibility and became stronger and became a better, richer medium, of course it also began to gain more appeal to the sensors. Of course, sensors have started to flood here as well. And now, it's kind of that we, we're realizing that sensors and intuitives come from different interests. I said that intuitives were more inclined to be sensitive, that means reacting more strongly, taking things more seriously, uh, feeling 
more trouble or inconvenience when something bad happens or when something's going on around them. Yeah, sensors, because they are more, I mean intuitives, because they are more sensitive, are more inclined to introspect on what they see and hear. Why did that happen? Why did that car come up right there? Why did this occur? Like the, there, is an, there is an imagination going on, going strong in the intuitive. As an intuitive, your imagination is in hyperdrive. You're constantly thinking about what you're experiencing. You're constantly thinking about why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. You're thinking about new patterns and what's going to happen next. And you're acting to intercept and to ensure that you don't become overwhelmed, that you don't become drained, that you don't become too much, that the, too much does not happen. Yeah, often I find that intuitives value privacy higher than sensors. And that can confuse a lot of intuitives into thinking they are introverts. Privacy just means being able to have time for yourself and to be able to do something without being watched. Yeah, intuitives like to be able to go into their own room or to their own environment. Intuitives like having that chance to take a second to breathe, to be in themselves. What I find with intuitive extroverts is that intuitive extroverts tend to say, I need to be alone. Can you guys leave me alone for a second? Intuitive extroverts tend to say, don't look at me. And while I'm working, intuitive extroverts tend to say, give me a break. Intuitive extroverts tend to say, don't touch me. Like, they tend to create this space. They tend to say to people what they are doing and what they're thinking about. But they also tend to say when they want to be alone. And that's also the key hallmark of an intuitive. That need to have undisturbed ability to think and to process that ability to want to read in patterns and to reflect on what you see and why it happens, to connect the dots, to see the patterns occurring around you. To the intuitive, there are patterns and hidden secrets behind everything. There are always mysteries behind the door that nobody has entered. There are, There is a pull towards the secrets of the universe for an intuitive. For the sensor, there is more a pull to the rush. The pull to the rush, the smells, the texture how the wind feels as it hits you, how the trees are dancing in the wind, how, the green, how green the grass is, how beautiful the environment is. To the sensor there is a need for richness and for experience and for that sensation, that positive experience of feeling something, of being somewhere. And I'm not saying here that intuitives can't enjoy sensing or that sensors can't enjoy intuition. But often it's that for an intuitive to enjoy a new environment or from, to enjoy a party, there has to be a pattern to explore at the party. There has to be a mystery that you're investigating. A philosopher going to a party needs to have this experiment that they're running, a theory that they're trying to test out, a conclusion they're trying to find on true, observing the people around them. Where the sensing extrovert can just be in the moment, can just dance, can just enjoy what's happening. The philosopher at the party has to have this pattern or theory to test out. Where the intuitive extrovert has to find things at the party, secrets at the party, hidden people, magic in people. Uh, the intuitive extrovert is going to the party looking for the one. They're going there, they're seeking for like... Uh, something new, they're seeking for a new sound, a new song, it's something thrilling, or something rich that they haven't heard before, something less overwhelming. Yeah, intuitive extroverts prioritize different things at parties than sensing extroverts, and that's what creates the distinction. That need to engage the world from your intuition, from your Im imagination, compared to that need to experience ideas from what you already know and from what you believe to be true and from a sense of realism. Yeah, sensors tend to value realism. The sense that something is real, the sense that something is uh, actually an opportunity, the sense that you actually know or that something fits with your history or to what you know, or to what you believe to be true or important. The sense that a new opportunity or new idea has appealed to the mainstream, to the public, to everyone. Yeah, sensors tend to want things that have appeal, things that everyone will like. If everyone likes it, a sensor will generally like it too. If everyone's interested in it, a sensor will generally find interest in it too. Yeah, sense, as a sensor, mainstream matters. As a sensor, action matters. As a sensor, doing is more important than thinking. Sensors are 
doers. They are people that act strongly and real, realistically. Censors are people that speak in strong language. Censors are people that capture attention, that grab attention. Censors are also people that build trust and stability. Around a censor, you will feel the sense of calm and the sense of uh, control because you are in your physical body. You are in your environment. You are in tune with where you are. And you are taking care of your surroundings and what's happening around you. You are not lost in the twilight zone. You're not lost in this hidden world. You're not oblivious to your surroundings. You're aware, you're perceptive, you're paying attention, and you're living in the moment. Now, if you have a person at your workplace that says, action, let's do it, let's work, let's focus, let's talk, let's be real, you're often probably dealing with a sensor. If you've got a person saying, let's think about it, what does that really mean? Are we sure about this? Can this really be true? Can we really prove this? Can we really test this? Then you're probably dealing with an intuitive, someone that likes to explore mysteries and secrets, someone that likes dealing and dabbling with the abstract, with the world of hypotheticals, of speculation, of possible, of opportunity, of patterns, and new trends, things that we can't possibly know anything about. And with that out of the way, let's talk about the feeling and the thinking type. Let's talk about the feelers, the people that enjoy daydreaming and free flow action, the people that like informal settings and situations. Let's talk about the thinkers, the people that like to know what they're doing and why they are doing it. Let's talk about the thinkers that like to have a structure or procedure or a goal or rules or something in place to help govern that creativity, to channel that power, that energy. Yeah, feelers are people that derive and see the most passion in quality. When you're motivating a feeler, you're speaking to quality, you're speaking about a qualitative goal. This experience, this argument, this intention, this character, you're talking about character of personality, you're talking about why a person does something. You're not talking about what they're doing and how they do it. When you're motivating a feeler, you're speaking about experience, the chance, the opportunity to have an experience, to feel something, to reach a certain emotional state. When you're dealing with a thinker, you're talking about a quantitative goal, you're talking about a set rule, or a set challenge, or a set opportunities that you can reach through learning these new rules, or tactics, or strategies. Yeah, thinkers love to think in terms of strategy and tactics. How do I make something happen? How do I improve? How do I do better than anyone else? What step-by-step -step guide can I use to reach success? What procedure can I invent to achieve something nobody has done before? What can I do to have that experience of power and of success and of achievement? And I'm not talking about achievement here for the sake of other people. I'm not talking about impressing anyone. I'm not talking about being successful in other people's eyes. No, I'm talking about purely that internal satisfaction you feel when you know that you've done something well. A feeler feels most satisfied, most passionate when they are working towards a qualitative goal and when they are able to reach and to achieve these qualities and to act in tune with their character and their ethics. They speak about being true to themselves. They speak about hitting or reaching or living in accordance with an ideology or a system of belief. They talk about spiritual goals and like these more vague and broad feelings. When you're listening to a thinker, the most passionate, the most satisfied with themselves, the thinkers will speak about reaching new goals and achieving projects and accomplishing qualitative, I mean quantitative goals, like reaching set actual uh, improvements, making a, uh, hitting a new audience, reaching a new target, reaching a new value, accomplishing something, achieving or finalizing something. Yeah, often the thinker is the most passionate when speaking about what they have done, what they've achieved, what they have been able to do, what they've learned. And the feeler the most passionate when talking about people they care about or uh, causes that they're passionate about or something that they are, that they find motivating even if they can't explain exactly how it works or what it means. Yeah, often you find feelers swarming to these new initiatives that nobody gets. Like, what does this movement want? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? 
when feelers are doing something, we people tend to not understand what this is that actually drives them. We don't understand the emotions and the anger and the feelings that are behind their actions. Of course, there is something behind it. Of course, there is something they're trying to do. Of course, there is something hidden they're trying to achieve here. And often, these movements tend to drive forward clear results in the, in the end. Yes, these movements tend to somewhat improve and become more clear and more reasonable over time. They tend to become and present uh, opinions and facts that we can all use. But these tend to be of a secondary value. They are only valuable as far as they can help achieve these emotional goals of the feeling types. These feeling types use and engage in objective or logical or formal thoughts or rules and structure only when it can aid them in reaching that emotional state that they are passionate about, such as freedom or happiness or peace. Thinkers tend to need clear definitions for what they are doing. If I'm working for peace, what am I doing to promote it? If I'm working for sustainability or for the environment, what exactly does that mean or entail? Thinkers tend to clarify goals and opinions and thoughts. They tend to make qualitative assessments quantitative. They tend to find formal definitions for how things work. They tend to formulate plans and strategies for how to execute an idea or how to get from point A to point B. We see, I note, that feelers and thinkers tend to explain themselves completely differently. Their process of rationalization is completely different. I hear feelers speak of intention. I did it because I wanted to... Because I did it because I am a good person. I did it because I want to be a good person. I did it because I want to be brave. I did it because I want to have character. Or because I want to be a virtuous, good person. Yeah, feelers tend to speak of virtue, character, of acting, and of being someone. They tend to be motivated by almost fictional motives. Fictional motives such as reading a story and feeling inspired by the character and wanting to be like them. Reading about the system of ethics or beliefs and wanting to live by that. Living by that policy, living by that standard of metric, even if it's quite... Uh, vague at times, or sometimes hard to apply. Feelers tend to go into a character, the character of someone capable, and then their thinking tends to follow along almost synchronistically. A feeling type goes into this role or thinks or reads about an intelligent person and then becomes more intelligent and becomes able to use the logic of this person. The feeling type tends to hear or to go into this feeling of wanting to achieve this amazing dish and then they find rules and strategies to achieve it it's always there secondarily it's always there secondarily that's always important to remember but it's always about pinpointing where the passion comes from what is it that makes the person passionate what is it that makes them satisfied a feeler that acts purely out of uh, wanting to achieve formal goals will feel no passion or satisfaction from reaching these goals. No, often it tends to be that the feeler goes into and tries to achieve these goals and tries to do and follow these plans and structures, yet they feel empty, yet they feel cold, yet they feel that they are not getting any value from it. And sometimes that can even drive feelers to try even harder. They can think, I'm not getting any value from it because I'm not working hard enough. And I need to do it more until I eventually start getting the value from it. Yeah, feelers are often pushing themselves to be like thinkers. They're often pushing themselves to think like a thinking type, even if they get no value or satisfaction from it. And thinkers do the same. I see thinkers trying to be more like feelers, especially women. Uh, women feel this urge to be like this and to talk like this and to do like do it like this. But often they get no satisfaction from it. That's the thing. They do it but because they have to, because they have this society or culture that tells them to do it. But because there is no value in it, because there is no inherent motivational quality from it, it gives them nothing. It makes them feel empty. It makes them feel cold and dispassionate. And it makes other people perceive them that way too. Yeah, I think often female political leaders that overuse feeling tend to be described as cold. And if they would be able to use their thinking more, they would come off actually more warmly. 
they would come off as more passionate, they would come off as more satisfied and more happy. And that in itself should be the goal, happiness, passion, motivation, energy, stimulation. Let's get back to intuition and sensing for a second. The inherent quality of intuition or sensing is that state of feeling good or passionate or interested, feeling that something is fun or engaging or stimulating, feeling that you're getting energy from something. When an intuitive goes into sensing, when they live that life of action, there's always a sense of frustration in it. They have to tell themselves to go to the party. They have to force themselves to get out there. They have to force themselves to act. They have to force themselves to do something, to be proactive. I have to force myself to finish my ideas, to work through things, to do things, to always produce something. I can't be happy with just thinking about or engaging in my intuition. I can't let myself feel at peace with just thinking about something. I have to always also force myself to be a little sensor like I have to always force myself to be and promote, produce something clear for other people to understand. It does it gives an intuitive value to pursue an abstract idea even if they can't explain it to anyone else. It gives them no energy, no joy, no pleasure to be understood by other people for this or to make it concrete or to make it understandable for other people. Actually, it can actually bore you. The more an intuitive tries to clarify and concretify their goal, the more they try to make it into something real and simplistic and something easy for other people. Often, the less stimulated they find themselves feeling about it. They feel, they feel their thirst, their satisfaction, their enthusiasm for the topic wavering. That's also why intuitives tend to switch goals frequently. It's not that that feel actually stops being interesting. It's not that they get bored with psychology, it's that they make psychology something shallow, something boring, something dull, and then they feel bored by it, and then they feel a need to move on from it. And that's also how we kill intuitives in school. When we go into school and we force them into this literal exercise of where everything has to be concrete and where everything you do has to be something simple, when you take away and discourage creativity and imaginative thought or abstract ideas because they are hard to explain. Yeah, because we always want to know what everyone else is doing, because we always want to understand and to formalize a word or a project in one sentence, because we want our ideas to be clear or to be perfect or to be uh, this one sentence dream, this uh, uh, packet idea that everyone can understand. We are discouraging intuitives. So think about what discourages you. Whether you're an intuitive or a sensor, think about what would discourage you. Think about what would drain you of energy. Think of what would make you feel the most bored and the least stimulated. As a sensor, you might realize that being forced into um, entertaining different ideas and nuances and possibilities that you don't understand that can actually drain and suck out your energy. And that's the challenge, balancing these two different values, balancing these two different interests. I see sensors often working towards franchising and towards ex uh, executing new ideas and to uh, making ideas clear, and that can be a sense of energy. Like the sensor actually gets more interested the longer they get into something. The sensor gets more interested the more concrete something becomes. The sensor feels better and more fascinated by a topic the more they know about it. The intuitive feels less engaged by it the more they know about it. And that's the contradiction here. That's the uh, craziness. That's the absurdity. We, uh, we are teaching different people. And we are struggling with people that lack interest for what we say. We notice that other people are not listening to us. We notice that other people are tuning out, that they're checking out, that they have uh, lost their interest in what we have to say. And that is, of course, because we've lost our ability to speak to them. We've perhaps made it too simple, or perhaps we made it too abstract. And it's about finding that silver line and to speaking to both audiences at once that can really engage and to mark a good communicator, a good speaker. And now we're hitting the end of this presentation and we're starting to think about what's next. What's next for you? What is your next step? What can you do to become better as a leader or as an explorer? What can you do to enhance your interest and energy? What can you do to become more passionate? What can you do to become more in touch with your nature? 
The next video I make will be about Enneagram types of personas and of masks, what happens when we step into these different masks, and I've already been touching upon this. I've been talking about intuitives and sensors, uh, sensors in intuition and intuitives in sensing, introverts in extroversion and extroverts in introversion. And I've found distinct patterns that I'm exploring in the book, The Power of Personas. Your next step can be to get the book The Hero Code and to learn more about these temperaments and of these attitudes. Your next step can be to start reading The Power of Persona and to read and explore the different masks that we all put on and engage in in different groups and in different settings. Your next step can be to surf into ericdor.com and to click your way to the online courses to start uh, reading through the different courses and to exploring and learning about the different types. Your next step can be to explore the cognitive functions and the different ways we process information and make decisions. Your next step can be to explore the different Enneagram types or the body language of the personality types. How different personality types tend to look or act or engage their body or how their facial expressions match up with how they think. I have a whole world of topics and things that I explore on my website. I offer online coaching for anyone who has questions about this and wants to learn more about it. I have an offer type consultations for people that want to find out their personality type. And I offer these ebooks where you can start le- reading for yourself and exploring deeper into these topics. My goal is to revolutionize the world of personality typology, to truly align the study of personality types with the study of health and well being and of balance and of flow. I am exploring what we can do to become more fulfilled as people and how we can use our cognitive functions as intelligences to achieve success in our careers and in our goals. I am passionate about this and I've been passionate about this for so many years as an intuitive because the human mind is such a jungle, it has so much to offer, there is so much inside that you don't know about yourself. There is so much you have yet to learn about yourself. There is so much untapped potential inside of you. Interests that you have forgotten to explore. Passions that reside inside you. Things that are important to you. That you don't realize the importance of. And it's time to start a process of introspection and exploration. It's time to start engaging and connecting with the people around you. Taking those new opportunities. Exploring these new passions. Stepping into these new situations. To learn more about yourself, to become more true to yourself, and to become more self-aware. That's all for today. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'm hoping that you'll also sign up for the next one.